All right, let's start this a second time. Hopefully this one will work. Uh, it's always the technical technical changes and technical issues uh, that we got to work out. Anyway, my name is Chris Bear. I'm producer of Unstuck, an OCD kids, kids movie. Thank you for joining in on this special Unstuck midweek holiday edition. We're going to be talking with Chrissy Hodges, who is an OCD coach uh, known to a lot of people in the OCD community. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about peer support, what she does, how perhaps that could help families and kids and also anyone with OCD. So we'll, um, we'll have a little conversation with her, assuming we can invite her in. Um, all right, let's try it. I see you. Uh, it just says, just, it's just allowing me for whatever to pin the comments. So, um, so do me a favor and great. All right, that's what I was just gonna say. Um, okay, technical things, but I realized I had the wrong settings on. So I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> Yay! I was like desperately just hitting any button everywhere. <laughs> As you were doing that, I realized that I didn't have the um, setting on that I could allow other people to invite themselves oh. in, so it was my fault. Anyway. Okay. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. This is such an honor. I love it. Cool. And um, so, folks, if you're joining, let me give you a little intro to Chrissy. We'll start. I'm going to start asking Q&A, but please feel free to use that comment and comment away because it'd be great to have like a conversation with as many people as possible and um, share this out to anybody, any of the groups that you're around or any people you think might uh, want to see this. Um, so Chrissy is a mental health advocate. She's an author of a book called Pure OCD, The Invisible Side of OCD. In 2017, the same year Unstuck came out, she was the Hero uh, Award recipient at, for the International OCD Foundation. Um, and she has OCD. She's learned through her own trials and tribulations, if you will, uh, how to help others. And so now she has a career as an OCD coach, peer support specialist, also provides consultations, ERP consulting. And so that's really why I wanted to bring her on because I'd love to talk more about what she does and how that might be help, how that plays into therapy and, you know, all that type of stuff. It's, it's really about trying to bring people information that they may not have heard or may not be aware of and, you know, in helping people get to where she is now and where kids in the film are in a better place. Mm -hmm. So hi um from brazil that's cool you're joining in so chrissy tell us a little bit about yourself um and like how you got to where you are oh okay <laughs> i'm like how much time do we have now um so i'll just give you the short run um and then we can kind of get into the i think the details and the basics of what peer support and all that is a little bit later um, but i yep. know people probably want to uh, they want to know the story and so um you know i I'm 41 at, right now, and I've been living with OCD since I was eight. Um, I, I, the symptoms showed up on a whim. I mean, literally, one day I was a normal, everyday kid. The next day, everything changed. Um, my first fear was the fear of vomiting, which was terrifying to me. I didn't know what it meant and why, but I all of a sudden was consumed where I'd never been consumed about that fear before. And as an eight-year-old my worldview was very limited and I was suffering with this need to know why and compulsions and I was terrified all the time. And the only thing I could think that made sense was I must have done something wrong or bad and that must mean that God was punishing me. I grew up in a very religious home so this was kind of all that I knew at that time and that's where right. scrupulosity really came in and took over. Scrupulosity is when um, OCD and religion get very intertwined. Um, and I started to believe that when this horrible feeling and these thoughts would happen, that meant that God was punishing me. And so I did lots of compulsions that were related to religion and um, thought to myself, if I was just a good person, then I would be punished minimally. Now, I also want to say I never wanted to tell my parents about it because I was terrified. My dad was a minister. So what would he think if he knew that God was punishing his daughter in real time? I mean, I must be a horrible person. And so um, into my teens, um, that fear is always stuck. And into my teens, I had some demon possession fears. I had some violent intrusive thoughts. And then it kind of came in and settled on sexual intrusive thoughts, What, which was... The biggest one was, um, did, did I turn gay or can I turn gay? 
And not that there's anything wrong with that. I did not, even in the South in the 90s, I did not think there was anything wrong with being gay, <laughs> which is, you know, bizarre considering it was 90s. No, but still, it's, <laughs> it, it's, um, it's, if you, it, it, the, your mind telling you maybe something happens that you didn't think happened is just, is, you know, you're trying to get over that process, especially in your teenage years, also dealing with the uh, religious issues. I mean, it's all so much to deal with. And if you're trying to hide it, you're not seeking help. You don't realize that other people could be having the same thoughts, even if they don't exactly. have these crazy intrusive thoughts. Well, I thought everybody was having these thoughts. I thought that maybe I just was handling it worse than everybody else. It, it, even though no one knew on the outside, I had this like image of perfection. Um, but I thought, well, this is just normal life and I just don't do normal life good. Um, and then when the HOCD showed up, oh, it just wrecked me. And I would, I would experience depression because you get exhausted from OCD. You're getting pummeled every day with intrusive thoughts and you're fighting them off and trying to live a good life and you're feeling guilt and you're feeling shame. You get exhausted. And so I, um, I just dealt with it, never told anybody, and then went into college. And my junior year in college, I just, I went into a crippling depression. And I couldn't handle it anymore, but I was too afraid to tell people. And this is the big reason why I got into advocacy. I was so scared to tell anybody. And back then we had AOL dial-up, so it wasn't like internet now. now but I was too yeah. afraid to put into the computer, did I turn gay? Why do I have sexual intrusive thoughts? Why this? And so I didn't tell anybody and I thought the only way is to die. And I attempted suicide and um, luckily I survived and um, was hospitalized. And I mean, by the grace of everything holy, a doctor there in that locked facility was like, I think you have OCD. I've never seen this before, but it really follows the same patterns. And that was, that was my diagnosis, even though, of course, I didn't believe it because nobody with intrusive thoughts believes it. <laughs> but um, medication right. worked. And, and I stayed on medication for a year until I found Dr. Stephen Phillips in. And he would, was willing to do therapy all the way in Georgia from New York over the phone. I never even knew what he looked like. And I got ERP therapy and I was able to learn to manage it. So you learn, so you, you found somebody who specifically treated and did ERP and then you were able to, that's, you know, to, um, a while ago we were talking to people about teletherapy and now, you know, you, you were, you weren't even sitting in the same room <laughs> with this person. You were just on the phone. So he had a trust that you like, you were listening and you were able to be, you know, we able to do it. Oh, yes. And the, I think the hook and sinker was his website, which Philipson is way beyond his years in just putting it out there and he does not care. <laughs> so in the 90s, he had this website that was just like HOCD, POCD, all this stuff and all these graduate stories. And when I saw it, I just thought, I don't know who this man is, but I need to meet him. And, and because I didn't believe I had OCD. You know, that's right. one of the secondary fears. And so when I, I typed an email to him and I was like, oh my God, is he going to write me back? And he did. And then when we started phone therapy, of course, he gave me zero reassurance, which sucked. <laughs> but, um, but yes, we conducted ERP over the phone. And to be honest, Chris, I didn't see him until years and years and years and years later. I only knew there was this voice over the phone that came on once a week and tortured me. <laughs> but you stuck with it, which is yes. amazing. And that's, you know, to, to people who are just learning about OCD now or just are still going through it, um, it, it takes so much guts and bravery and courage to do an exposure. And, you know, it's very, I imagine it's very easy to just say, you know, I'm going to say I'm going to do it, I'm not going to do it. I'm only going to do it halfway or it hurt too much, I'm not going to do it again. But you got to a point where you just said, I got to do this, even though it's uncomfortable, even though yes. this might feel hurt, hurt me painfully, and you did it. So the point that I was at, which is often where I see when I'm working with someone and they get to this point, I go, yes. That point is, I am willing to do anything to get better. Meaning, I, you know, I, I, one of my first clients ever in peer support for OCD, he said, I will put my head through a brick wall 
if that means that I will get better. If Philipson tells me to put my head through a brick wall, I'll do it. And that's where I was at. I, I really was at the, and, and I think a lot of times in ERP, you have to go, I'm willing to do just about anything. I'm going to take the risk, live with the uncertainty and trust the process. Because if you, OCD is going to throw you tons of doubt, the whole process of, oh, what if this therapy doesn't work? You know, and, and what if the therapy proves that your fears are real? And what if you're the only one that has this fear, but it actually proves that you really are what you're worried about. And what if the therapist thinks that it's going to throw you all that stuff the whole time. And I just was at this point. I remember the first time I met with Phillips and I just said, I am suicidal because suicidal thoughts are a symptom of mine. Um, that's just what happens when I dive down into the depression realm. Now I see suicidal thoughts as a warning, like, okay, something's wrong. I need to get help. So I'm not afraid of them anymore. Um, but I told Phillips and I was like, I don't have any other choice at this point. I feel like there's no other option, but whatever you can do. And he was like, yes. <laughs> so what can we do? Yep, with Let's go. And he really, we hit the ground running and I was willing, I was scared and it wasn't easy, but I was willing to do just about anything because I guess even when I look back, I felt like I deserved to have a life that was OCD free. I deserve, not free, I'm sorry, that was managed OCD, but I deserved that. And that's not something that I had ever felt before. And I thought maybe I am strong enough and capable enough to be able to do that. Well, I wanna get to um, some of the stuff that you were doing when you were younger as a kid. However, I'd love to talk about, so, you know, you got to this point, you're in therapy, you're, you're getting better. What made, what, what made you decide, A, I want to write a book and then B, oh, I want to, you know, I'm not sure what order they came in, but I want to help other people. I want to, um, you know, give, give what I know and help back and mentor other people. So, okay. Um, the first one, the book and helping other people, they're all combined. And I've said this before. So if anybody follows my advocacy, you've probably heard me say this. When I started ERP, I, was, I remember the moment I was sitting on the psychology steps when I, when I saw that it could work, meaning like I could learn to manage this and have a life that I wanted, whereas OCD always told me I couldn't. Um, I remember looking up into the sky and going, oh my gosh, what if I could tell my story one day and help one person? And OCD was like, nope. <laughs> and all of the doubts of, never tell your story. People won't believe you. People are really going to think you're in the closet and that you don't have OCD and you should be ashamed. And I remember, you know, succumbing to that guilt and going, okay, I'll never suggest that again. And for the next 13 years, I dove inward. And I, what I like to talk, what I like to say to people is I had to go through the grieving process of living with OCD and that's what I did. Unfortunately, it took 13 years, but those were different times. Um, I had to grieve the fact that I wasn't the person I could have been without OCD. I had to grieve the fact that, um, that I am the person now with a mental illness, which was hard. Um, I had to grieve all the things I'd lost, all the relationships I damaged in my head, you know, because of this. And so it took a long time. And then I relapsed in 2011 and it was a horrific relapse. It was violent intrusive thoughts. It was, I'm murdering people in the street with my car. It was relationship OCD. And I thought, this isn't going away. And why do I hate myself? By the way, I hate myself because I have OCD. Why? I, and, and, so, and, and I'm tired of hating who I am every day. And so who cares? I have a mental illness. That's the way it is. So let's write the story. Let's get it out there. And that is when it happened. And I, I literally, I actually started writing the story to remind myself that I had OCD in the relapse because we forget, you know, because it feels so real. And so I started with sure. at age eight. And I wrote the whole story so I could read it back and remember that I had OCD. And then when I got done, I thought, this is pretty interesting. And I, I decided that I would publish it. And then I decided, what can I do? I know there are people out there. I know they're, they're scared and they're hiding. 
And I know there was back then in 2011, there wasn't a lot on, you know, the pure OCD type, which is a nickname for the type of OCD that I live with. And so I just thought, what's the harm in trying to find the people? And that's what I did. Um, and so, yeah, Michelle, definitely a, a story of courage, especially when you think of, you know, a lot of people out there think, you know, uh, I have this issue or my kid has this issue. We got to get it taken care of right now. Yes. And, you know, why isn't this working right away? And, um, you know, Chrissy just said it, it was a 13 year journey to get to the point where she was willing to even go public. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, I always have observed with my daughter and my wife and I doing ERP with her. It's like sometimes there's one step forward and eight steps back, Yes, you know, have to crawl your way back, uh, but you have to stick with it. Um, um, so you decided that, okay, I'm going to tell my story. And now you are doing, you know, uh, describe what your, what your, what your business is now or what your, what your product, you know, what, what you're able to do and how different ways that you're able to help people with those. Okay. So I do want to say, you know, based on what you just said, the, the sole reason that kept me quiet was the shame. That was the sole reason, the shame of what other people would think, the shame of, you know, of, you know, what the world would think, or the, also the shame of what's the backlash I'm going to get from people. And when you start advocacy, when you start helping people, these are big things to consider. And then the more you help and the more you get your story out there and you get your truth out there, the more those things start to dissipate. It's just like ERP. If you face the fears, you find out that they're not as huge as you thought that they were. And emotions are no different. And emotions go hand in hand with OCD fears. And oftentimes I kind of quote Dr. Phillipson, which is if there was an emotion, you wouldn't even have the fears anyway. So I took that to heart when it came to advocacy. And that was this, okay, I'm going to feel shame, guilt, and embarrassment. And my rule of thumb, and I said this with Kim Quinlan a couple weeks ago, is I am willing to put whatever out to the world as long as I'm willing to get negative feedback. And, and that has served me well in the last eight years. And that is, if, if I'm going to put something out there and I get negative feedback, I can handle it. If I can't and I'm not ready to get negative feedback, don't put it out there. <laughs> for real. Mm -hmm. So, um, certainly amount of trolls out there. <laughs> exactly. And they will troll you, especially with sexual, violent, and blasphemous, intrusive thoughts. So, um, I started writing the book when I relapsed, and that was the vision. That was always the vision. And, um, I'm, it, it took me a long time to get to what to peer support, which is what I do now full time. Peer support is an up and coming field in mental health. It is p people using their lived experience to help support and normalize what others are going through with mental illness. It doesn't matter if it's OCD, schizophrenia, bipolar, any illness whatsoever. And so it is important if you're doing peer support, number one, to be trained, number two, to get supervised and to have experience um, and, and to use that experience if you're gonna go into private practice, which is what I do now. It took me a long time to get to where I am now. And I will give you a little bit of a review of what that looks like. Um, when I started to do advocacy, which was back in 2013 was when I really got serious about it. I went to the uh, IOCDF conference in Atlanta. That's where I met Shannon Shy, Jeff Bell, Margaret Sisson, you know, Riley, you know, the late Riley Sisson, um, all of these amazing advocates. And I thought, oh my God, this is it. This is it. And so I started working with Matt Miles here in Denver, who's an OCD specialist. And he trained me to do coaching with individuals with OCD. So he worked in McLean as a therapist. And in McLean, their model right. was there's the therapist and then there's the coach, which is the therapist in training. And so they're always mm -hmm. supervised by somebody who has way more training and understanding of OCD. So he found that there was a need with his clients who were homebound. He needed somebody to come in as a coach that could help them through their ERP exposures and who got it. And, you know, even though I wasn't a therapist, I, I only have a bachelor's in psychology and I only have peer support training. I get it. And so under his supervision, 
I was able to follow his ERP plan and help individuals that were homebound or that were just struggling with, I don't want to do ERP. This is too scary. I could come in and say, I've done it. So let's do an exposure together and I'm going to talk you through it and use peer support to help normalize what's going on here. And the fact that I got it, people are like, oh, you've been through this? So it's interesting that you have a therapist who's giving them the treatment, giving them like the scientific guides or giving them like, you know, the trained medical knowledge. And then you have a peer support that comes in and says, I've also done this. I've lived it. And I, so, you know, it's, you're not just learning, you're not just hearing from an expert, you're hearing from somebody who's gone through it. Let's do it together. Mm -hmm. The one, two punch of that hopefully helps people get over the hump of, of, you know, starting to really get hardcore about doing their ERP. It is a winning strategy. I mean, it's this, you have, because oftentimes, and in, in working with peer support in my own practice, people will say, I have a great therapist, but they just don't get it. They don't understand when I have fears about turning into a pedophile, that it's too hard to do the ERP and they're pushing me to do it. They don't get it. And I'm like, I get it. So what, what can we do? How can I help? How can I help tell you that I've been there? I've had those fears before. And then they're like, oh, so it, it's not weird for you. It is a winning combination to be able to have an expert say, I want you to do this. And someone that's been there say, I've done it. And here I am. And it doesn't bother me anymore. And I can say all this stuff. And, and, and that person goes, oh, well, if she's done it and this person's the expert, then maybe I will take the risk and do it too. It really is this combination that is amazing. And, you know, just, just to put the disclaimer out, I work in that capacity as an ERP coach. I work with therapists. I don't work on my own. I work following their ERP plan. They supervise me and I record notes and give it back to them. So I'm not someone out there just saying, look, I can do this when it comes to ERP, because for me, it's the most important that we look at. These people are the experts in treating OCD. I'm here to emphasize what they do and to help motivate you while you do it. Yeah, absolutely. Michelle, you're right. Lived experience makes two. And I love, you know, the idea, which is why I was intrigued when I met Chrissy a couple of years ago and heard and read, started reading about her. And then, you know, we talked on the phone a couple of months ago because the idea of giving anybody that extra support to be able to kind of um, work with the therapist. And I know that, you know, I started hearing about OCD coaches. I started hearing about how they were trying to take the, you know, some people are trying to get people to pay for uh, services that aren't the therapist and to hear that somebody is saying like Chrissy I work with I yes you know, I'm, it's a one-two punch type of scenario you know we're a team and um, I mean it does take a team sometimes to help you get over your fears I mean my you know you're involved yeah. in family members sometimes you might have exposures that have to deal with I'm afraid of my aunt or my uncle or something and so the more people that can have you and help you get over what you're doing will hopefully get you better faster. Uh, if you have any questions for Chrissy, feel free to use that comment button. Um, and we'll happy to answer questions. I got a lot, so I'll keep going for a little while longer. I won't keep you too long, Chrissy, but I'm good. Um, I think that was great. <laughs> I like hearing, you know, what a coach does. It's good to get people to know that information. You know, it's hard enough to find a therapist. So are you able to practice um, only in your state or are you able to kind of like work with a practice like you, you know, um, the guy in New York did like, so how does that kind of, how do your services work? Okay. So there are two different, there are two things that three things that I do in my practice. N number one is the ERP coach. So when we're looking at, when we're looking at the label of a coach, other than what peer support, okay, let me just keep this simple. When we're looking at the label of an ERP coach. That's when I work solely with a therapist. And I know a lot of the therapists in, in you know, the community. So it's easy to say, okay, well, we're going to work together and then we can keep kind of, we can help support the client together. The second thing I do, which probably is the main part of my business is peer support. So peer support is independent of any other OCD therapist, except for that I get supervision by an OCD therapist, which is important because anybody yeah. in practice, when they're working with people in the field of mental health, you know, we need supervision. <laughs> it's important. So that's why I always say to people, if you're going to exchange money 
with coaches and peer supports, ask if they're supervised, ask if they're credentialed. Um, so I am credentialed in the state of Colorado. I worked in the institutes for um, a couple years um, with every type of mental illness. So I'm not just OCD specific. I can work with any mental illness um, and I've been trained and continued education and supervised on how to do that. Um, and a little side note, my business partner and I and our business just won the, um, we were awarded the contract to put peers in the institutes. So That's great. I know it's amazing. However, I will still be doing peer support for OCD. Um, peer support is, again, it's not, it, it's not working with a therapist and I'm going to tell you what, it is not giving you therapy and it's not giving you reassurance. I don't know what order to put that in <laughs> because when people reach out for peer support, they, the first thing they think is, oh, are we going to do exposures? No. And then, oh, are you going to give me reassurance? No. <laughs> Peer support is using my lived experience and the continued education that I have to be able to support you in your journey to recovery. So why is that important? And why can that be beneficial, you know, with therapy? Because I can provide support for the emotional turmoil that all of us experience with OCD. And we all know what that means. I can provide support in normalizing the symptoms. That does not mean saying, you know, that, that doesn't mean normalizing the symptoms, meaning they're real or not, but normalizing it as I have them too. You're not alone. And then normalizing the whole experience of ERP, which is why do I have to do these crazy, ridiculous exposures? I, I don't feel right. I don't, I feel unsafe. I want anxiety yeah. to keep me from doing this horrible stuff and I can help normalize that because I've been there. And that's what peer support is. It's supplemental to therapy. It's not a replacement for therapy, but oh my gosh, it just helps in every stage of recovery and especially in the emotional turmoil piece. We've seen similar, like, you know, my wife and I say, we first we got our daughter help, then we got ourselves help in the sense that it took us six or eight months, but we found a group of people in Brooklyn and Manhattan, kids with anxiety and OCD that we could come together every couple of weeks and we would just have a, you know, sit around and be able to talk about lived experience, what we were going through, because it, a lot of what I'm reading through what you're saying is you can't talk to other people about it, but the second you know yes. there's somebody else with it, you can joke about it. <laughs> You can exchange different ideas, but that's how we found, you know, we, because of one of the other parents in the group is how we found the like group OCD camp that our daughters ended up going to. Yes. So it was like, you could just trade information in some ways. Sometimes some of the Facebook groups that are going on now, you're kind of uh, working on at least helping each other. And as long as, you know, you're, you're conscious not to try to enable uh, or reassure, then, you know, you're, 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 trying to benefit everybody and give them your knowledge and experience and make them feel like, okay, if she can do it, I can too. Or if they went through it, so can we, it might suck, but we got to do it. Right. And that is the absolute benefit of having a trained and supervised peer support is that people who I do sessions with, I mean, they tempt me to give them reassurance. Trust me. I, I mean, every single person that I work with, they're like, so I know this might be reassurance, but but at the same time, I, I am trained. It's my job to not to exacerbate the OCD. So, and, and that's what supervision is for. And that is what understanding, like my job is not to make OCD worse. My job is just to be there to help people. And so that's the important thing, of, or that's what, why peer support is somebody And there's, as far as I know, there's only one other person doing peer support, um, specifically for OCD and that's Shannon Shy. Um, I'm not sure if he's mm -hmm. taking clients right now, but he's also wonderful because it's, we have been trained, we're supervised, we understand like structured peer support that you are paying for is going to be not like therapy, but we have that mindset of like, we don't want to make things worse. We want to make things better and we're going to help pave that way and support you and walk alongside you to get there. So when you're so if I'm if sorry, I was gonna say, um, if uh, when would be a good time to bring in a peer supporter? 
you know, it doesn't, um, you know, in your view, when do you usually start with clients or, you know, um, you know, if, if somebody's listening to this in a replay or whatever, when's a good time to like reach out and see if you can find that extra support? So one of the other things that I do, I know it sounds like I do tons of stuff, but at the same time, you know, my goal is to get people to therapy and support them and get them to the recovery. But one of the other things that I do is referral consultations, meaning I can meet with people, do a consultation and help point them into the direction of therapists in their state or outside their state, in their country or outside their country. You asked that earlier. I'm in Colorado. There are no limits yet to peer support. Hopefully that won't change anytime soon. Um, <laughs> but um, peer support is also involved in the referral consultation. So with that said, when you are struggling with OCD and you don't even know what to do, peer support can be, in, can be helpful. I can help share my experience and normalize where you are right now. I just learned I have sim I had symptoms. I just saw a video and figured out I had HOCD. What do I do now? Let me help point you in that direction. Then there's the next stage of I'm going into therapy and I'm terrified. What's going to happen? What does that mean? And, and what if it proves this? And what if it proves that I can help and peer support there? In therapy, I have to do these exposures and now all of a sudden I'm getting the backdoor spike and I don't know what that means and what do I do? Peer support can help there. After therapy, I'm relapsing. And yeah, the honeymoon period is over and yes. things start creeping in, life gets back to normal and so does some of those thoughts. Peer support. I come in most of the time with people. I sometimes I have the privilege sometimes of working all the way through the cycle. And then maybe we don't meet for a while. And then all of a sudden, like the privilege of being able to come back and say, I'm still here for you. And, and, and let me tell you about my first relapse, the biggest learning experience of my life, you know, and being able to, for them to go, oh, this is normal. Okay. So I'm going to be okay. Yes. So any right, there's recovery. A there's uh, I think um, we've heard it when interviewing other kids, there's like feeling like, well, uh, I've beaten a lot of my issues. And so therefore, um, like, I can't, I can't suddenly fall back as that happens. So mm -hmm. understanding that that's all part of the process. It's normal OCDs. Like you said, it's um, you, when you are in recovery, you're also in the stage of being vigilant and, you know, w looking out for if things are bothering you or stressful periods. Um, so, how also, um, you know, because we deal with and talk with a lot of kids and families, how are you able to kind of work with um, parental units mm. or even just, you know, family units or extended family? How does peer, how could peer support work with a lot, you know, um, to help the entire family with um, working through therapy? So peer support does work with families, spouses, kids, parents, all of this. And the reason why is because I just, stick, you know, Peer support has all to do with lived experience, meaning I am a child of someone's. I am a partner of someone's. I am, you know, I have played all these roles that I can relate to other people and say, here's my lived experience. Oftentimes when I'm meeting with parents and when I'm in, you know, I always go into meeting with um, support systems with the, um, I know they just want to, they want to know what to do. They want, they, they want to come out of this session and they, they want to know what to do and everything's going to be okay. So they're this pretty similar to meeting with someone with OCD. And so I break yeah. the uncertainty. I don't give reassurance to parents either. <laughs> so I think across the board, reassurance is not part of my gig. But what I do is I try to help open their eyes to what it's like for the sufferer. And, and there is no winner or loser either. There is no, the sufferer is right, the support's wrong, the support's right, this, no. This is just a, here is the reality. And he, how can I share my experience in order to help you understand what your child or what your spouse is going through? And that's the most important thing to remember is that I am neutral a hundred percent across the board. I obviously represent individuals with lived experience, but it is so eye-opening and enlightening for people to talk to someone who's been through it and is now seen recovery because it gives them hope too. If she can do it, yeah. my child can do it. And they may ask me things like, 
well, what can I do and, 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 and what should I do? And my job is not to give advice, advice, but I often say this, communicate to each other and ask your child or your spouse, what should I say? And what shouldn't I say? Because those are two important questions when you are communicating about OCD and about lived experience with mental illness. And if you follow that, what helps and what doesn't help? All of a sudden, the lines of communications are new for everybody versus this, you know, support system of just wanting to make everything better. And they usually do. They just want to make everything better. But the person over here is so shrouded in shame and guilt and embarrassment. They don't even know what's going to help. But I guarantee you, they know what's not going to help. Oh, <laughs> and yeah. so opening up those uh, lines really does help. And sometimes it takes somebody who's been there to just say, here's some questions you can ask. Here's some ways you can construct a conversation and learn how moving forward to, to just build some respect and trust between each other. And it will help. Yeah, I mean, it's like you can't just, you're not necessarily going to jump right into let's fight this thing. You know, you have to establish that communication. You have to, you know, that person who has those thoughts has to be brave enough to talk to you. You have to be able to accept, try not to judge and figure out, okay, you know, work on I'm not here to, you know, shame you or make mm -hmm. you angry or make you feel weird for it. I'm here to try to be helpful. And so, um, uh, you know, th it's about... Um, being able to kind of work something together. Um, Lauren, I just didn't want to let your question go. Um, after this, I will put Chrissy's website uh, in the comments so you can find her site. Um, and yeah, and I agree, Chrissy is definitely awesome and I'm glad she was able to help your kids, which kind of leads me to a um, couple of final questions. One, we were just talking about communication over the lines of parents. Um, you know, have you ever thought like, what would you, um, you know, if you were back to that eight or nine year old kid just starting to get those thoughts, um, how you would, you know, um, we find a lot of times parents, kids are hiding it, they don't get, so what are things parents might be able to look for in their kid if they're, you know, um, perhaps they're, they're concerned that maybe they have OCD or they're, they're, they're you know, having um, strange thoughts or doing strange rituals that are, you know, new to them. You know, what are things parents can look for to start to open that conversation? Okay, so I'm just going to be real here. Um, myself and so many other people that live with what the, the, the type of OCD, and I'm, I'm not trying to type OCDs, but, you know, the nickname is pure OCD. So this is going to be sexual, violent, blasphemous, all these intrusive thoughts with mental rituals, pretty much undetectable to people around them because all the rituals are happening in their head. As honest as I can be, there's not much anyone could have ever said that would make me admit of what I was going on, except normalization. Because we become, when we were dealing with OCD, especially some of the really tough, scary, shameful, intrusive thoughts, we are so scared. Number one, if we say it out loud, it means they're true. Number two, what if we say it out loud and our parents think that we really are that? All these fears put this huge wall of I'm not telling anybody, I'm never going to say anything, and I don't even know what's going on. And so when I'm doing talks and people ask this question, and it is very common, I say this, if you are a parent, talk to your kids about what you have heard about unstuck the OCD kids movie. Talk to your parents about what I'm telling you right now, which is sexual violent intrusive thoughts are common with people with OCD at a young age. Don't be afraid to say, because it's, 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 if you're not used to saying things like the word homosexual or pedophile or violence or murder, like you're scared as a parent. You don't want to say that to your child because what if you you know, say something and then you create OCD or whatever. But what I try to right. tell people is this, open up to your kids around the age of 10, 11, and 12. And especially if you start noticing avoidant behavior, especially if you start noticing panic attacks, but then they're like, nothing, I'm okay. <laughs> All of those weird anxiety issues and say to them, 
you know what? I saw this bizarre video with this girl with this big hair on YouTube about sexual and violent intrusive thoughts. I want you to watch it with me. Isn't this weird? <laughs> you can even kind of disguise it. But if someone had shown me a video or a blog when I was a teenager on anything, I would have been like, I would not have said anything to my parents probably. I don't know if I would have, but I would have gone and been like, there is a reason there's an explanation. I might be okay. Right. So share the information. Yeah, don't be afraid to say things and don't be afraid if your child has intrusive thoughts about tough issues because this is what OCD does. It's going to dig as deep as it can and be as obscure. And they may even be incest thoughts and that might scare you and make you feel weird, but intrusive thoughts are terrifying to the person that experiences them. And they're not telling you because they're too scared. So if you bring it up, they're going to go, Oh, you're safe. I can tell and you. you might have to bring it up a number of times. That's the other thing too. I mean, I find that sometimes it's about a lot of what we were going through a lot of the throes of OCD. It was about um, thinking of creative or fun ways to do exposures, making it, um, and always not seem so routine. So if there are ways that hey, that conversation didn't work, how else can we bring it up? What else can we watch? Yes. What else can we look at, you know, that might break the barriers. And that person may come to you a month later and finally break, you know, and, and open up to you. But it's about, you know, keep going. And that's kind of like a, uh, uh, you know, just a preview for what you have to do with therapy is keep fighting, keep going, because you will have, you know, setbacks and lit victories. Um, I'd love to kind of know what are your fa um, some of your favorite uh, resources, you know, if you had to say, say somebody, you know, go to one, two, three, what would be the three things you would say, you know, this will give you a lot of help on OCD? Um, the OCD stories, hands down, you know, I love Sue. Um, intrusivethoughts.org, Aaron Harvey, he is just a beast. I mean, he just goes after, he wants to, he wants to find everybody in the world with intrusive thoughts. And I am just in awe of that guy. Um, so I would say the OCD stories, intrusive thoughts, and of course, Phillipson's website, ocdonline.com. Those are my, probably my top three referrals. Um, if I could add a few more, um, if people can't afford therapy, which I know is a huge problem and, and they're, or they're not in a yeah. place right now where they can't get to the right treatment, there are things you can do to get the support and to get the knowledge without it being too reassurancey, which is going to be no CD. Um, no CD is yep. available on Apple, but it's also just now becoming available on Android. Yes. Um, no CD. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's it's just now coming out. Um, I know they were working on it for a long time, so that's great to hear. Yeah, I just got the news, so I don't know if it's up and running yet, but it will be very soon. So, um, No CD is available at treatmyocd.com, and then there's um, Freedom from Obsessive Compulsive Disorder by Jonathan Grayson. These are workbooks. If you are at a place where you can't afford therapy, at least you can start understanding how ERP works through there through Getting Over OCD by Jonathan Abramowitz, and then the Mindfulness Workbook by Jonathan, uh, or I'm sorry, John Hirschfield. The three Johns, Jonathan right. Abramowitz, John Hirschfield, and Jonathan Grayson. <laughs> Grayson, yeah. The three Johns, they work great. Well, um, thank you so much for coming on and talking to me tonight. Uh, I'm going to throw, um, Chrissy just threw a lot of resources there. So in a few minutes, I'm going to go back and put all those links in there because those are all awesome people and awesome sites and Stuart's podcast. So you can listen to wherever you are. Um, and I really appreciate it. Can't wait to see you soon. And thank yes. you so much. And I'll throw Chrissy's website in there too. So you can ask questions about peer support, coaching, referrals, all that. stuff. And thank you, Chris. And just so you know, I mean, I refer and stuff as much as I can when pa I, cause I get pe parents reach out to me all the time about kids and unstuck is my top referral for that. So thank you for what you do. I mean, oh, we appreciate your it. girls are so lucky to have you and the support and for you out there advocating. It is so important. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Have a good holiday and I'll talk to you soon. Bye everyone. Thank you so much for joining uh, Unstuck Talks with Chrissy Hodges. Um, if you're watching the replay, feel free to add comments and we will continue to ask, uh, answer them as long as this is up. Anyway, I'm Chris. Have a good holiday. We'll see you next month with another Unstuck Kids Speak Out.